I'll ascend the pulpit as well. Good evening, brothers. I will admit that I was dismayed when I saw the schedule for the Office Bears Conference. The organizers gave me the 8.30 p.m. time slot. Talking about church discipline at 8.30 on a Friday night is a challenge. You worked a full day today. Your mind is now full of the principles of preaching. So you're starting to think about the snowy or slushy drive home. So there's a formidable challenge, both for you as listeners and also for me as the speaker. But reflecting on my assignment for tonight, I concluded that it is somehow fitting. It's fitting that we talk about discipline at this later hour while dealing with a bit of fatigue, because that is so often when we talk about discipline in our churches, when it's late and we're tired. It's Monday evening or Thursday evening, or whatever. The consistory meeting is entering its third hour. Discussion has turned to the watch list or members in need of special attention. It's a turn of the ward elders to talk about one brother, a single man. They don't have a good report. The brother has been on the list for a couple of years. And the trend is not positive. Maybe it's sporadic church attendance, or he's kind of dating a non-believer, or it's some Sunday work. Some of this or all of this together with a general refusal to talk to the elders. Church discipline has previously been mentioned in the same sentence as this brother's name. And now it is again. But this time, the ward elders seem more convinced. We need to start the process of church discipline. This brother really should be withheld from the Lord's table. And if there's still no change, we have to escalate this to the first step, an announcement of his sin to the congregation. After the ward elders say their peace, there's one of those rare moments of silence in consistory. The gears are grind grinding. The other brothers are mulling it over. But then a few voices are heard, and there is hesitation. Taking this step will alienate our brother. Our contact with him is minimal already. This will only make it impossible. Our brother is a bruised reed and a smoldering wick, so we should be patient. The ward elders try to respond to all the comments as they're being made, but they're getting flustered. They certainly don't want to come down hard. They don't want to make a bad situation worse. They insist their goal remains the brother's restoration. But the discussion is clearly floundering. The hour is now well advanced and people are tired. Everyone is looking to the chairman. Can the chairman, the minister usually, can he navigate a course that will satisfy both the desire to discipline and also the plea for patience. Can he steer between those rocky shoals? It's very hard to be the chairman of consistory. And here's a challenge when we talk about church discipline. Everyone wants clarity. We want a sure fire method, a clear vision for dealing with our unrepentant members. We want an answer that will work at 8.45 p.m. on consistory night. Not just a pragmatic solution, but a course of action that works because it is the right thing to do. The biblical thing, the loving and wise thing. Well, if there's one unfailing source of clarity, it is the word of God. God delights to show us his way, and he delights for us to walk in it. That's true for church discipline, too. And so we turn together tonight to Ezekiel 33. I'm not delivering a sermon on this passage, but I'd like to propose that this passage speaks to our question of church discipline in a pointed way. Ezekiel 33 gives us the precision of purpose that we need, spear-filled wisdom, the right sense of urgency, 
and even a reminder of our blessed freedom as we care for the people of Christ. Ezekiel 33, we'll read verse 1 to 9. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, if I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman, and if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, Then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any one of them, That person is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. Well, first, a brief word about the setting of that fascinating passage. Ezekiel was one of God's prophets, and he had an onerous assignment. He didn't get to minister in the land of Israel, familiar territory, but he had to go to the heartland of the enemy, the empire of Babylon. Ezekiel himself was part of a first shipment of exiles. The Babylonians had scraped off the upper crust of Judean society, removing them to Mesopotamia. Now Ezekiel has to bring the exiles the word of God. Before we get further, let's just highlight how that speaks of God's abounding grace that he does not stop sending messengers. He wants to address his rebellious people even while they are bearing their deserved sentence in exile. If nothing else, God is persistent in his gracious pleading. Persistent, which is surely a lesson for those who will wield the key of church discipline. So Ezekiel goes and he preaches a message of admonition in this first section of the book, telling about God's imminent punishment of their sin. Namely, that if there is no repentance, God will withdraw his glory completely. And that's what we see happening in chapter 9 and 10 of the book. God's going to take away his glory. So Judah needs to listen. As Ezekiel keeps saying, the sword is coming and the wicked person is going to die. Ezekiel likens his ministry to that of the posting of watchmen. Watchmen were a familiar sight. Men on the walls and fortifications of Jerusalem who stood constantly on guard, scanning the horizon for enemies, making ready to welcome allies. Everyone knew that the loud blasts of the trumpet signaled the approach of a threat. It was time to take cover, close the gates. There's another kind of watchman too, one for defending the people's spiritual integrity, not just physical. For enemies lurked inside Jerusalem too. The temptation to worship the gods of the nations or the confusion fostered by false prophets Against many dangers, Ezekiel was a watchman. I have made you a watchman. The elders of the land were watchmen too, as were the faithful priests and righteous kings. The point is, there was a crying need for someone to blow the trumpet. I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. God says to Ezekiel, whenever you hear a word from my mouth, verse 7, you shall give them a warning from me. It sounds simple, 
But blowing the trumpet is hard work. A couple of my daughters have played in a high school concert band. And I find that the trumpeters often look like they're about to blow a gasket. Cheeks out, face beat red, forehead contorted in pain. Maybe they're doing it all wrong, but it seems like if you want to get a good sound out of a trumpet, you have to know what you're doing. It's going to take some effort. Well, surely the same is true for a watchman for God's people, what the New Testament calls an overseer, watchman, overseer. Their task is hard, accompanied by heavy responsibility. Lives depend on it, quite literally. Listen to what God says to Ezekiel. I paraphrase, if you see the sword of judgment coming, and don't blow your trumpet, and people die in their sin, then I will require their blood of you. God says to his servants, warn my sinning people. Tell them to turn from their iniquity. But God then conceives of a situation where the watchman doesn't do that work of blowing his trumpet. He remains silent when he should make some noise. And notice then the doubly tragic result. Not only do sinners die in their sin, but the watchman himself is held to account. God says, more than once, their blood I will require of you. You'll have to answer for your failing and explain why you were silent. A person died. You could have prevented it. Much depends on the activity of trumpet blowing. If a watchman does sound the trumpet and the sinner listens and responds, for him there will be preservation and a future. Look at verse 5. If he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. Instead of dying, the sinner lives. He lives through a well-placed admonition. Now I know that Ezekiel 33 is not about church discipline in exactly the way we confess it as Reformed churches. We don't read here of formal steps of censure, ones that we're familiar with, but it's not far off. Let's connect several dots between this chapter and what happens in discipline. In both Ezekiel 33 and your consistory's situation of discipline, there is unrepentant sin. In both, there is a God-sanctioned warning for the sinner. In both, there is a basis for this warning in God's seeking and saving love. In both Ezekiel 33 and your situation of discipline, God employs human messengers to bring his warning. And in both, there are two possible outcomes from the warning, repentance or hardening. And those outcomes have consequences in both life or death. And in both, this puts a responsibility not only on the sinner, but on God's messenger, on the elder, on the watchman. I'll repeat verse 7 to appreciate how it gives us a mandate for church discipline. God says to his watchman, whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. From God, through his elders, the warning comes. The Church of Christ needs trumpet blowers. So the watchmen of the church have an urgent task. Because like in Ezekiel's time, there is a sword coming. This time the sword is final. God has appointed the day of judgment to which all people will be called. Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Because that is so, because judgment is approaching, God lays upon us the calling to speak and to warn. He does because a rebuke has the ability to bring about repentance 
and then the gift of God's forgiveness through Christ Jesus. We see how the New Testament underlines that ancient truth of Ezekiel 33. Take Galatians 6 verse 1, for example. It says there, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Find a way to restore the one who is overtaken by his sin, lest he bear sin's curse. Or compare it to how Jude, in verse 23, urges us to save others with fear, pulling them from the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. You can hear that just like in Ezekiel, being a watchman is a serious business. Pulling people out of the fire. Elders need to speak prophetically, issuing a clear and sober warning of the certain consequences of a person's attitudes or actions. So let's reflect, brothers, for a moment on our task. The Holy Spirit says in Hebrews that the church's leaders keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Keep watch, he says, for we are like watchmen at the end of our night shift. We have a debriefing with our commanding officer called before our King Jesus Christ. What will we say about our work as overseers? What account, Hebrews 13, will we give to him? We'll speak of our actions, our good intentions, maybe admit our mistakes. It will be the account of weak men, an account of some victories and not a few losses. And Ezekiel's words should make us pause. When we have to give an account of our work, will there be the blood of any sinner on our hands? Will God require that of us? Should I have said something more about his sin? Blown my trumpet more urgently? Should I have been more direct, less fearful, less concerned about how they might respond from a human point of view? Should we as consistory have taken action earlier and put someone under church discipline? Would that have helped him? Turn from his sin and walk with Christ. These are important reflections in regard to church discipline. I intimated earlier that sometimes we misunderstand church discipline by viewing it as almost entirely negative, as something that we want to avoid at all costs, resorting to it only when there's really nothing else to do. Even though we know that Jesus himself authorizes it, church discipline can somehow be seen as contrary to his commandment that we love one another. Here is surely one of those areas in church life where the thinking of our culture, the spirit of the age, has made an indelible mark. Ours is a time of almost unqualified acceptance and toleration. We've all developed a real aversion to telling someone else that they are wrong. Above all, Christians have to be nice people. And to rebuke someone just isn't nice. And church discipline can seem the epitome of not niceness. And so we hesitate. In our churches, we've also begun to become more mindful of the non-believers around us. That's a good thing. We want to reach out to them with the gospel, open the doors, invite them in to hear the true preaching, for we know its power. But our desire to warmly embrace new members can sometimes, sometimes get conflicted by the demands of God's word. What I mean is, we fear that a prospective member may be discouraged by our emphasis on Christian obedience. If we come on too strong, he or she may well just go down the road 
to the church there where they're willing to overlook this or that sin. You can feel this unspoken pressure to slim down the requirements of the gospel in connection with God's holiness and Christ's lordship. And not just in relation to new members, but our established members. There can be this reluctance to move toward discipline. We hear it said, this will only alienate the brother, the sister, maybe their family too. This will burn whatever is left of the bridge between consistory and him. And so the consistory meeting ends with a decision on church discipline being deferred yet again. Maybe the opposite can also be true. It's more rare, but we can enter into church discipline too quickly. That's again because we haven't understood it properly. There can be a desire to give someone their just desserts. Let's be honest, there are those in our congregation who antagonize us, who irritate us. Consistory's work would be easier if this member just took the hint and moved on. So how do we find our way between hesitations and hastiness? Well, biblical wisdom requires that we consider our motives. What is at the heart of what we're doing? What's at the heart? And here we return to Ezekiel 33. For the watchman's warning words spring from God's own heart. For God, to warn a sinner is to love him. Look at verse 10 and 11. And you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus have you said, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? God's desire for the salvation of sinners comes out so clearly. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that he turn from his evil way and live. That's God's amazing, undeserved mercy. And it's always operative in his warnings and discipline. God wants the restoration of the one who is lost. And it's a love that we should emulate as leaders in Christ's church. Here we see how the atmosphere of our churches should be in contrast to the atmosphere of this world. The unbelieving world, for all its emphasis on toleration and acceptance, is an un loving place. People who don't conform to the articles of the secular creed are quickly excommunicated. As one author put it, in our time, cancel culture is the new church discipline. If someone steps wrongly, if he voices the wrong opinion on gender or race or marriage, the transgressing person is accused, tried, sentenced, and expelled with no time for questions or deliberation or compassion. Not so in the church. We don't rush to cancel people, but we take time to disciple people. I'm sure it's been pointed out to you before that the word disciple is at the root of discipline. There's a simple clue to how even by the activity of say, withholding someone from the Lord's table, we are trying to disciple believers. Discipline and discipling running together. In love, we want to teach them how better to follow Jesus, our master. In scripture, discipling involves encouragement and prayer. Together with correction and admonition, God knows that we need it. We go astray when we regard church discipline as only remedial, only corrective, and not as something formative or instructive. What I mean is we shouldn't 
think of discipline as the final and essentially separate phase of our interaction with a church member. A desperate, last-ditch attempt to put things right. In a general sense, the discipline is what we do for every member. For every member, as we seek to promote holy living and true belief. The Bible consistently speaks of discipline in a positive way, something meant to produce a harvest of righteousness, Hebrews 12. That's the discipline, that's the discipling that we are busy with every day, every week, at every home visit, during every meeting, every chat over coffee. We do these things because we love our people. It's about doing what we can to assist them in following Christ. If we see church discipline as not disconnected from all that positive work of formative discipline, then it becomes easier to accept censure as a legitimate option. We have loved this member all along, and we will keep loving them. When a member is enslaved by Satan, when she's falling prey to the deceptive power of sin, we sound the trumpet. Maybe we even rattle the sword, lest she die in her guilt. We might even, as one more effort to help her, excommunicate her. We love her too much not to do so. I appreciate how Jonathan Lehman, in his short book, Church Discipline, emphasizes the loving motivations of church discipline. He says it's loving in at least four ways. It shows love, church discipline does, to the church, protecting the congregation from the influence of unrepentant sin. It also shows love to the world, church discipline, because through the church's faithfulness, through the church's integrity, unbelievers will have a better opportunity to see the transforming power of Christ in his body. Discipline shows love for God. We want to uphold the honor of his holy name. And discipline shows love for that sinner, calling them to repent, warning them of all that they will miss if they do not come and follow Christ. In relation to that last point, love for the sinner, think of how Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, describes the discipline of a hardened sinner. He says there, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Remarkable. Paul is talking about putting someone outside of the communion of Christ, akin to handing a person over to the devil. And yet it's done with this loving goal, the person's ultimate salvation in the day of Christ. Just as God says in Ezekiel, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, that he turn and be forgiven. Because we love the sinner and want what is best for him, we sound that warning trumpet. I still recall one troubled young woman in a congregation that I served. The elders had been reaching out to her time and again with no success. She was put under discipline and eventually she withdrew from the church. So there was no happy ending as far as we could see. But after she left, I once had the opportunity to speak with her. And she said a surprising thing to me. She said that though she always put up big walls against the elders, and as irritating as the elders were, she always knew her elders loved her. She knew they would keep calling. They would keep showing up at her door, even as she wandered. The elders would be there, and somehow that was an encouragement to her. And maybe God will use that experience of the elders' care to draw her back one day. 
I'm sure that not all our straying members appreciate the efforts of the elders, but we should never discount the power, the impact of a Christ-like love. As we approach the end of our time, we'll draw out some implications. Think of being at a consistory meeting in the near future, and it's time for one of those difficult discussions of discipline. What is going to be helpful for you? Well, we'll start with the object of discipline. Who gets disciplined in a formal way, that is? Well, Ezekiel talks about the wicked, those needing to turn from their evil way. Likewise, the Heidelberg Catechism speaks of discipline being applied to those who call themselves Christians, but show themselves to be unchristian in doctrine or life. What does that mean, to be unchristian? Well, being a Christian isn't just receiving the mark of baptism or having membership in a Reformed church. A Christian is someone who confesses the name of Christ, someone who presents himself to God as a sacrifice of thanksgiving and who fights against sin and the devil. Now, we all sin. That's the truism of the night. We all sin, but Christians who have the Holy Spirit cannot remain in recognized sin for long. A living Christian will be unsettled by his sin, uncomfortable with its presence. And so by God's grace, he'll strive to repent. Formal discipline should be brought to bear when an individual seems content to remain in known sin. When an acquiescence to the desires of sin is characteristic of his life. What kind of sin do we mean? What traditionally theologians have spoken of discipline applying when sins are not only unrepented from, but when they are also outward, so having an external, visible manifestation, unrepented from, outward, and when they are serious sins. We don't put every little sin under discipline because we remember that love covers a multitude of sins. All sin is an offense to God and the Lord Jesus. Nevertheless, there are some sins, some serious sins that call into doubt a person's confession of the faith. There is no approved list of sins eligible for discipline. Sin resists classification because sinners like us are endlessly creative with our sinning. And so perhaps two people commit ostensibly the same outward and serious sin. Looks like they've done the same thing. And yet there's a host of other factors that affect the elder's perception of this member and his or her sin. And those factors shape how we should act and react. We have many questions and factors to consider. Thinking about this sinning member, has there been a long pattern of disobedience? Or is this a one-off event? What's the characteristic response of the sinner to the words of the elders? Another thing to think about, does the sinner freely admit his wrong or does he seek to excuse it? Does he seem genuinely grieved for what he has done? Did the sinner freely make a confession of guilt or was he found out? When speaking about his or her sin, is a person forthcoming about how it happened or is he always evasive, ambiguous? Was the person led into this sin by someone more powerful than him or her? Someone more persuasive? Are there factors in his immediate family that make the sin more likely, not excusable, but almost understandable? 
Does the sinner welcome godly counsel? Or is he convinced that he knows best? Does he seek help in the fight against a habitual sin? Is he willing to address the consequences of sin? Does he make restitution, putting right what has been wrong, even at inconvenience to himself? There's much to consider. No wonder our discussions of discipline at consistory can be prolonged. So much to consider. Then there is the perennial question of timing. How fast or slow the process should go. And here we wish there was a formula. If only there was an algorithm to help us decide when and how to take the next step. When is it right to underscore our warnings with decisive action. For the various consistories that I have served or sometimes advised over the years, the big step is really the first step. When should a person go from simply being on the watch list to being withheld from the Lord's table? Is this sin outward Serious, unrepentant, is it such that we are ready to put this member outside the kingdom? It's a significant move. It's a step which means consistories sometimes wait almost indefinitely before silent censure, before making the first announcement. And the question has been asked many times did we then start too late? If I may generalize, we are good at warning. We're good at waiting. By God's grace, we're good at searching for wandering sheep. But then we always hesitate to put them out of God's fold. And then so the number of members under watch, members of concern, those who appear on Consistory's agenda, that number multiplies year after year. Many of those members are in a holding pattern, neither improving nor being prodded along by discipline. Yes, it is a significant move because of the understanding that to begin discipline, we have to be prepared to see it through to completion. The pattern laid down by Jesus in Matthew 18 shapes our overall strategy. If a person will not listen to repeated admonitions and will not listen to the church, then we are to treat this member as a pagan and a tax collector. So when do we proceed? The short answer, as long as it takes for us to conclude that this person is characteristically unrepentant. We can't see into a person's heart but we can weigh the evidence of their repentance. And sometimes we arrive at that conclusion in one or two evenings. More often it takes months of sifting through the evidence, as it were, talking it through and praying for God's good guidance. There's no formula or algorithm, but there is a spirit. And that's the spirit of love. We seek to understand, to help, to do whatever we can to exhort the sinner to return to the ways of God. And sometimes God gives the beautiful privilege of seeing a person under discipline repent. We get that privilege once in a while, seeing repentance. Other times, the work of blowing the trumpet is very hard indeed. We feel like we're going to blow a gasket. There's so little Response. An elder wonders, what does diligent discipline look like when all my phone calls go ignored? How do I pursue someone who keeps shutting the door on me, who clearly doesn't want to talk? Well, then I would ask again, are you still sounding the trumpet? Has this brother or sister heard the truth from your lips? Maybe you haven't been able to have a normal visit with them for more than three years, but perhaps you have texted them or written them a a letter or a note or 
dropped in at their house and had an awkward conversation at the front door? The question is, have you in one way or another sounded the trumpet to warn them that they're going to die apart from Christ? That's what God calls us to do. We have to do it because the prospect of failure is terrifying. We know what happened to Judah in the time of Ezekiel. They did not repent. And so the temple was destroyed and thousands more were taken into exile. Fast forward 70 years and God says, I'm going to save my remnant. But by that point, that's all it was, a remnant. The sword came and the blood of many was on their own head. It still happens today. The watchmen might do their job. You call out sin, you warn of judgment, you apply church discipline, yet a sinner does not break from his sinful lifestyle. You put some people under formal church discipline, and that is effectively the end of their relationship with the church and Christ. They're gone. And the pain of them leaving makes us feel the weight of our task. Have I, in one way or another, have I sounded the trumpet for this brother, this sister? For me as a preacher too, I find that an intimidating thought. Have I really warned people like I should? Or have I been too gentle, too nice? For elders too, have you sounded the trumpet? I don't want us to be motivated by fear of failure. Ezekiel 33 is a confronting passage, and maybe we react by saying, I don't want anyone's blood on my hands, so let's start discipline and quick. This is not about doing what we need to do so that we can leave the consistory meeting on time or finish our term with a clear conscience. Rather, we keep, or we should try to keep the weight of responsibility well balanced. If I have honestly warned a brother about the coming judgment, and if I have held out the gospel of Christ and the demands of his gospel, but he hasn't listened, then his blood is on his own head. And from that perspective, I would say we have a blessed freedom If the watchmen have been diligent, God absolves them of responsibility. They do not have blood on their hands. If we've said what we need to, if we've done what we reasonably could do, then we can leave it in God's hands. It's a hard saying, but we cannot control a person's response. We can speak the truth to them, pray for their good answer, but we cannot compel them to respond rightly. So that puts the onus on us to speak and to pray, to use the tools that Christ gives us, but having done that, we are free. Listen to how Paul speaks of his ministry in Acts 20. He's speaking with the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, just before his departure, and he puts the accent there on something unexpected. In verse 26 and 27, he says, therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. His hands don't have blood on them. Makes you think of Ezekiel 33. And notice how he connects his innocence with his commitment to preaching all of God's word. He has said what he needs to say. He says, I'm innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He preached the gospel of Christ, of course, but surely he also warned the Ephesians against returning to their pagan idols, descending again into immorality. Paul said, what he needed to. So he's leaving Ephesus 
with a clear conscience. The same is true for church leaders today. When we faithfully bring the word, when we use the means of grace, including church discipline, we can have confidence to leave the results to God and his mighty spirit that frees us from fear, frees us from false guilt, frees us from the pressure of trying to save someone by our own efforts. And then holding on to hope, remember what can happen from Ezekiel. Read a few verses more, verse 14 to 16. Again, though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, yet if he turns from his sin and does what is just and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has taken by robbery, and walks in the statutes of life, not doing injustice, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the sins that he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is just and right. He shall surely live. Don't doubt God's power. The watchman's warning can turn the wicked from his sin. By God's grace, the sinner can turn and do what is just and right. And God assures us that for Jesus' sake, he forgives the one who repents. God wants no sinner to perish, but all to come to a knowledge of his truth. That's something to hold on to as we care for the people of Christ. Thank you.